support new things. You know, instead of being a stumbling block, the local church can be the encourager, the inspirer, the, the, the permission giver to be innovative and even allow its people to leave the walls of the church and, and do new things. When a new space is started, um, the local church can pray for them and help spread the word. It's real important to understand new spaces are not about replacing the local church. They're alongside it. Okay? I think, too, we do our own members a service uh, when we give them new options. Uh, you know, so many times what happens, you get a, a new person in your church, they're finally willing to step up and volunteer, say, I'm willing to do something, and you say, well, you know what, we, we have an opening on trustees, or, or we, we really need a new volunteer on youth ministries. Now, trustees are important, and youth ministry is vital, absolutely. But that might not be where that person is being called to serve. It might not be their passion. It might not be the way they want to serve God and the church. So perhaps, maybe, there is room for new and vibrant ministries. In fact, we need new ways of doing new and vibrant ministries. Um, why? Just to increase our numbers? Well, no. I, I mean, numbers are nice. Um, but it's not about numbers. It's about making disciples. And the fact is, we've heard it from um, Adam, we heard it at the laity session the other day, you can see it in the reports that keep coming out, um, and in fact there was one just a few months ago, the number of people who are leaving the church is, is in fact accelerating. Um, it's, the, the percentages are growing faster than people had expected. So the fact is, we live in a world and a society that is just increasingly being filled with the nuns and the duns, the spiritual but not religious, uh, with an entire generation with dwindling interest in even setting foot in any church uh, with doing anything with organized institutional religion and certain segments of society that, yeah, they will not step foot in a brick and mortar church. It's not going to happen. I mean, the days are just gone when we can put up a building, slap the church sign on the front and expect that people are going to come running to us. I, we're fortunate here. We live in the Bible Belt, but even here, we're losing ground. So, in addition to the inherited local church, we need pioneers and entrepreneurs with the gifts and the graces to gather people in new ways, in new venues, so we can meet them where they're at, so that we can tell them about a Wesleyan understanding of grace, and we can show them a God who loves them more than we can ask or imagine. We were reminded at the laity session that Jesus did not say, make the disciples come to me. Jesus said, go and make disciples. That is the point of new faces, new spaces. Uh, similar work is already being done around the country. Uh, the Florida Conference, uh, for example, they have a variety of initiatives with such wonderfully descriptive names as the Tattoo Parlor Church, Painting and Parables, Dinner Church, Bibles and Bait, Cinema Conversation, Greens and Grace, Theology and Comics, and my personal favorite, Recovering from Bad Religion. Uh, but the fact is, we don't have to go outside of our conference to see original work. Uh, we've been seeing original, uh, there we go, there's a slide, right? Uh, we've been seeing um, videos throughout an annual conference showing this. There are more to come. Um, in addition, this past August, so every year, the Board of Laity and Lay Servant Ministries has a joint event. Uh, the one coming up, by the way, is August 18th, save the date, so shameless plug there. Uh, but the one we had this last August was about innovative ministries in our conference, and there were over 25 of them shown, um, most of them led by laity, I should point out. From giving gardens to um, juvenile detention, from coffee shops to working with the homeless, our conference already has this undercurrent of activity, just waiting to have the permission and the opportunity to be unleashed. We're blessed with individuals such as Tindra Saul, who's out at Lover's Lane. She started a ministry to pair uh, adults with special needs kids to help mainstream those kids into society. She works with their African congregations, with people from, to integrate the children uh, from multiple countries. She visits the homes of refugees just so that these people know that they are seen and they're valued and they're heard. She is doing unique ministry and it is making a real difference in the world. That is what New Faces, New Spaces is hoping to accomplish. I, just imagine what it would be like to no longer be slotted into certain ways of doing ministry, to no longer be leashed to the usual ways of doing things, to be able to try new ideas for reaching others, to have a chance to do new ministries, to have a way to live out your passion and your calling. And you won't have to do this on your own. 
See, as part of this work, the conference is going to provide support, including group coaching, cohorts, uh, retreats with like-minded people. It, it's like a venture capital incubator for getting small businesses off the ground. You don't have to be alone in starting something new. So perhaps you have ideas. You know, you've always wanted to try this. You, you've been thinking about that, uh, you know, considering if you should. Now you have the permission and the opportunity to do it. And if you're not the person with those ideas, you know what? You know somebody who does. Go back to your local church. Let other people know about this. Encourage them to try. Encourage your laity, and I'm talking to everyone, clergy and laity alike, encourage your laity to come up with ways to do ministry that don't have to be the same old, same old. The new approaches don't have to happen in the church building. They don't need to be large. They just need to gather new faces to make new disciples. There are a lot of people who need to hear the message we have to offer. Fortunately, there are a lot of Methodists in North Texas. And you know what? Most of them are laity. So whether you're in the local church or in new spaces, let's focus on unleashing the power of the laity. Give them the opportunity and the permission to flourish because then we unleash the power of the church to build the kingdom of God right here on earth. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And Bishop, this concludes the report. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, concluding our morning, and I know there are a couple of other things on the agenda, but concluding our morning will be the Centers for the, uh, from the North Texas Conference. So I want to uh, say a special word of, of appreciation to Marty Soper, Andy Lewis, and Owen Ross for the alignment work that has been going on in the, in the conference of which you will hear about. Uh, the other persons who are in the choir loft, I understand, are part of the presentation. I was getting a little scared then for a little bit. Anyway, so uh, I want to thank you all, and so we, we gladly hear this report. Uh, there will be a couple of announcements after this report related to uh, our time when we go to lunch and uh, to update you about what we'll be doing this afternoon. I think you should go. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Many of you remember the day when there was no competition for church on Sunday mornings, no sports, no school activities, and even the stores that were open on Sunday did not open until after church was over. I grew up in the country, and I did not have cable TV, and even if I wanted to skip church to stay home and watch TV, the only thing on the four channels I got was church. <laughs> And even when I was a kid, which wasn't that long ago, it seemed like everybody went to church. The only real question was, which church? Friends, those days are gone. The United Methodist Church has experienced a steady decline over the last 50 years, not only in membership, but in prestige. The broad context in which we do our ministry is one where people are much more attached to the culture than to their churches. Adam Hamilton mentioned it yesterday. Every generation is now experiencing growth in the numbers of nuns and duns, and only one third of our young people affiliate with any kind of organized religion. For many people, the church is out of touch and irrelevant. So if we want to offer a compelling witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ in this new day, we must do something different, something new. 
So hear the good news. We worship a God who specializes in doing a new thing. Amen. As the prophet Isaiah shares with us, God says, I am about to do a new thing. It is springing forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the wasteland. Amen. Since last July, the three of us, along with our district superintendents and the rest of the extended cabinet, have been working to discern that new thing that God is doing in our midst and then to align our work around that new thing. As a result of that discernment and alignment process, we have been meeting together more. We've been collaborating more. And more and more, we've begun to see ourselves as all part of one team. So that's why we're standing together before you to offer one combined report rather than three separate reports to share about our center's work. And the theme that runs through this report is new faces for new spaces. We believe that gathering new faces and new spaces is the new thing that God is doing. And moving forward, it will be for us our chief missional strategy for helping you to be successful, to connect with your mission fields, and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we're talking about our role in this new strategy in this way. We are here to be catalysts, to catalyze gatherings of new faces and new spaces in and through every local church and in targeted mission fields. Many churches are already doing this. They are gathering new faces and new spaces. You have seen video examples of some of these. And while clergy may lead many of these, most of these will be led by laypersons. For example, St. Luke Community, itself, Community Church asks itself, where do young African-American men gather? They said the barber shop. So now on Monday evening, St. Luke Community Church has started a men's Bible study in a barber shop, and they have plans to multiply that in barber shops throughout South Dallas. Here's another example. Yeah, man. For 40 years, volunteers from First United Methodist Church in Gainesville have run a ministry called STAR which stands for second time around. STAR provides necessities like clothing, furniture, household goods for people in need all around Gainesville. But recently, the leaders of this ministry have made an intentional shift to see their neighbors, to see those who were customers as now potential partners in ministry, to be in ministry with their neighbors in a relational way and not merely a transactional way. And as a result, discipleship is happening at STAR. Their newest volunteer is a gentleman who first came in need of clothing. Now he volunteers there every day and worships at First UMC in Gainesville. Amen. Winsboro, Texas is home to 3,500 full-time residents, but attracts many more people who go to Winsboro because of the beautiful lakes, unique boutiques, and specialty restaurants. During her daily walks through town, Pastor Debbie Lyons made an effort to meet all of the, the entrepreneurs and shop owners on Main Street. One of the shop owners who had not been to a traditional church in years met Debbie and was so impressed and hungered so much for the word of God that she offered the loft above, above her shop for Bible study. The gathering is now a weekly event scheduled around the timing of when those shops open so shop owners can get to their shops in time to open them up, them up at 10 o'clock. So these are all examples of new spaces for a new day. And friends, we have a bold vision, a vision for every local church, large and small, urban, rural, suburban, to be dreaming about new spaces and working toward creating them. Our vision is for laity, even more than clergy, to be creating these new spaces. Our vision is for us to recapture our Methodist zeal 
for connecting with the mission field and making disciples in fresh and innovative ways. I recognize that there was a present need for young adults here at Hamilton Park. The important thing is that we're planting those seeds, the seeds of the gospel in those lives, and uh, 30 years from now, 10 years from now, those seeds may grow. You know, change is awfully hard, and especially when you're older, it's even harder. But uh, yeah, it was difficult at first for some folks, but I really think it's been a great, great asset. Mark, our pastor, this is my church, and he came to me. One day, and he said, how can we help you? Because I had gone to treatment. And when I came back from treatment, he said, how can we help you? What, what can we do as a community to, to wrap our arms around you and, and help you through this? So at this point, you might be wondering, we hope you're wondering, what exactly do you mean by a new space? Hopefully, based on the videos, the vignettes you've heard, it's clear that new spaces can take on many different shapes and forms. As you dream about new spaces, we want you to be creative, to listen to the unique needs of people in your mission field. With that said, however, we envision new spaces having these four things in common. First, a new space gathers new faces. A new space does not merely gather already churched people in new ways. By design, it gives unchurched and dechurched people the kinds of people that we were reminded Jesus spent his time with, a fresh experience of Christian community. Without new faces, it's not a new space. Second, a new space meets regularly. Regularly could mean weekly. Regularly could mean monthly. It could be something in between. A new space could meet regularly online. A one-time outreach event, however, is not a new space. Without regular meetings, it's not a new space. Third, a new space relates to a United Methodist Church entity. Most new spaces, as we envision them, will break the mold of typical forms of church. But a new space is still a part of the body of Christ. And so every new space will have a supportive connection to a local church or a campus ministry or some other United Methodist Church entity. But listen to this next sentence. This is so important. The point of that connection is not for that new space to necessarily funnel new members into the local church and feed the institution. The point of that connection is for the institution to support and cultivate and nurture that new space. Without a connection to a UMC entity, it's not a new space. And fourth, a new space forms disciples. There are lots of ways to define a disciple. The definition that we're using is a disciple is a person who follows the way of Jesus. So every new space will help people follow in the way of Jesus. Some will do that with a strong component of Bible study, but others won't. Some will have a strong element of hands-on service and justice work, but others won't. Still others will utilize music and liturgy, but others won't. The way that disciples are formed will vary based on context, but without discipleship. It's not a new space. We are excited about the potential of new spaces and how they will help us as a conference connect to our mission fields and make disciples. We're excited about how this work of innovation has the potential to shift the culture of our congregations and of our conference. But the North Texas Conference remains committed to the work of improvement, to resourcing churches and existing spaces as well. This time last year, there was a transition in our center, and I was given the great opportunity to lead the Healthy Church Initiative, which is celebrating five years since our first churches entered the process. Through the HCI, churches have been transformed, new ministries have been birthed, and hundreds of people have been touched by the churches that have really worked hard in transforming their church. 
Five years, over 50 churches have participated in HCI. If your church or if you have participated in any of the phases of HCI, that, um, from HCI, SCI, LCI, if you or your church have participated in HCI, will you please stand so we can recognize you? church development really express our gratitude towards our coaches, our consultants, our pastors, and especially our lay people that have really worked hard to make the HCI process a success. We continue to work with HCI and with the help of my amazing design team. These wonderful folks and I have created a new process for HCI. This process will help churches that already have gone through the HCI process because we looked at our present, our past, and our future objectives, and we were wondering, well, what's next? Well, HCI next is what's next. So this process, again, is for churches who have been through HCI and want to continue looking really hard at themselves and continue to transform in the way they do church. The process, again, looks at, the hard selves, at our hard selves and makes sure that we know how to enhance our ministries. But for the churches that have never gone through HCI, you're probably wondering, what is this girl doing here? Who is she? And, HCI, we still will continue to do HCI, the original process, and we will continue to provide that process for you in the original process itself. So thank you. HCI is a hard process. For anyone who's been through the three phases, know that it is a hard process. It was based off a book uh, called Renovate or Die. And for, and for many, as I've talked to them, HCI has just been too hard. For others, they're not ready to engage into the, into the deep change of their church. And, for, and so plainly spoken, HCI is not for everyone. For some churches, and I know I, I can feel this way, I like my church how it is. I like the songs I sing, I like the way we sing them, and I like the people I sing them with. So what New Spaces does is it comes to you and it does not ask necessarily for a deep change in your existing spaces. It doesn't say you, the songs you sing, you must stop singing them, or you now must sing them to a guitar and drums, or you need to sing them with different people. But we do know that we still have the Great Commission. We do know that not everyone likes the songs and the style that we sing in. And we do know that God is calling us to reach out to them. And so we are entering into this process to equip you and assist you in creating new spaces that will reach new faces while continuing to maintain and strengthening our existing spaces. New Spaces does not say to you, renovate or die. New Spaces says to you, create. Creating new spaces where new faces can gather will require us to leave the building and get to know our communities. It's time for all of us to increase our cultural intelligence so we can effectively communicate and work with others. Our neighbors may speak an unfamiliar cultural language, a language based on national origin, on political ideology, race, gender, age, or many others, to name a few. The spring, this spring, folks standing with me gathered for two days equipping a two-day equipping event led by Reverend Dr. Maria Dixon Hall. They have both a passion for and experience with cross-cultural settings and relationships. Let's take a look. As a conference, we want to do a couple of things. Um, 
we want to do a cultural intelligence training that could be available in a broad way across the conference and that we can utilize in churches, we can help churches to understand their mission field better, we can help churches to um, know who their neighbors are and how that may or may not feel comfortable and why so that they can be um, intelligent in how they reach out to their community and meet their neighbors. It's impacted me as a person becoming a culturally intelligent person and um, what I appreciate about cultural intelligence, the difference I think from diversity training is um, the goal is to love, um, not just to have an appreciation for differences and learning how to work well across those cultures and knowing yourself and having a uh, cultural intelligence about yourself is um, beneficial for not just um, your own work for the world of others. This is a wonderful way to really put together how I could uh, minister and how I could reach out more uh, people outside of the church the community particularly. And I think knowing and having tools on how to understand people I will make the church kind of grow and at the same time myself as a pastor in knowing and relating to people. As clergy, our first call is to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're not just talking to people in the pews, we're talking to people in the neighborhood, we're talking to the people in the restaurant, we're talking to people in the doctor's offices, we're talking to the people that we will encounter every day. So if clergy are not equipped to begin to have the skills, the knowledge, to strategize for these conversations, they really are not able to fulfill the call of being a minister of the gospel. At its heart, cultural intelligence is simply the belief that every one of us has a primary cultural language that scripts our behavior, scripts the way that we see the world, and it scripts the way that we communicate. But friends, we can learn new languages. And the more languages that we speak, the more effective our communication will become. Cultural intelligence is all about knowing the communication needs of the people we are in relationship with so that we can work together more authentically and more effectively. To do this, we have to be aware of our own invisible cultural scripts. We need to know the biases that blind us and prevent us from successfully engaging in cross-cultural relationships and ministry. Our hope in the North Texas Conference is to deploy this team of very gifted leaders to support congregational learning, whether it's for cross-cultural appointments, or where our neighbors and colleagues need to speak a different cultural language, we believe that cultural intelligence will help us communicate strategically and learn how to be in relationship with the communities with which we are surrounded. And when we are in relationship, our differences, yes, our differences, will strengthen our common ministry. Like cultural intelligence training, the zip code connection which began in 2013 is another way we're exploring the how of gathering new faces in new spaces. Through the work of Christian community development and advocating for systemic justice, the zip code connection was first imagined with two orienting goals. The first was to focus our collective impact as the North Texas Annual Conference in long-term ministry with our neighbors in two areas, one rural and one urban, for the purpose of overcoming systemic oppression and generational poverty. And the second goal uh, was to extrovert these learnings that happen in these two areas to the rest of our conference so that we can inspire and uh, strengthen similar efforts that are already going on and that just might be. Today, the Zip Code Connection is working to help clarify and listen deeply to the dreams of residents in Clarksville and Red River County 
and South Dallas Fair Park for the dreams that they have for their own community and neighborhoods. Neighbors desire places, that their neighborhoods become places that are more fully vibrant, thriving communities, recognized as good places to live, work, learn, do business, raise children, and practice one's faith. And since 2013, we have learned a great deal, much of it through trial and error. We've learned to not bite off more than we can chew, and to only go where we are invited by people of peace. Now we are confident that some of our new efforts will make us even better partners with our neighbors in these communities and beyond. These are three of those new efforts. Developing local leadership. Both zip code areas are convening local advisory teams to guide their development, knowing that local leadership must be encouraged and nurtured to create sustainable futures. The Texas Methodist Foundation is experimenting with us in adapting the Holy Conversations discernment process, normally used in local churches. This adapted process focuses the advisory teams on three questions. Who are we now as a community and organization? Who are our neighbors? And what difference is God asking us to make? As part of the Center for Missional Outreach's pivot toward catalyzing ch local church efforts, the Zip Code Connection is exploring ways to engage both areas through local churches, existing organizations, and in partnership with pastors and laity who are passionate about and committed to connecting to their community in a deep and relational way. Some of those local church leaders from both Clarksville, Red River County, and South Dallas Fair Park are standing here today. Beginning March 1st, Warren UMC entered a test phase of partnership with the Zipco Connection. This effort is aimed at encouraging and resourcing Warren as we live into our call to be a ministry hub, in other words, be the church, at the corner of Malcolm X and MLK Boulevards in South Dallas. And in keeping with our original goal for the Zip Code Connection, we are developing clear ways for local churches and individuals to be a part of the work that residents direct and ways to extrovert our learnings all around the conference. In the meantime, if you would like to connect with the work in either area or if you would just like to learn how you could explore similar efforts where you are in your own community and neighborhoods, please contact us at the Center for Missional Outreach. We're glad to preach and present, facilitate a learning group, or just talk about your ideas and hopes for your church and community. And now, I want to welcome the newest member of the Center for Missional Outreach team. Well, good morning, I'm Jarita Williams, and I am the new face at the conference staff as an associate director for the Center for Missional Outreach. I am so excited to be a part of this center. Uh, it exists to come alongside local churches in making disciples through ministry with their neighbors, particularly the poor. With that being said, did you know that students not reading on his or her grade level by the third grade is four times less likely to graduate high school on time, and six times less likely if they're from lower income families. But one child plus one mentor plus one church plus one community can change at a time. It can make a difference. In 2015, Bishop McKee and the CMO cast a vision focusing on one-on-one -on -one mentoring through church school partnerships. The initiative is one plus one, and this year, we are breathing new life into this initiative, and I'm excited about it. A key partner in our work will be First UMC Dallas. This partnership is with J.J. Rose, with First Dallas and in an elementary school in Dallas, and South Dallas Fair Park for over four years. In that time, this partnership 
which began with one-on-one -on -one mentoring, has grown to include a wide range of ministries, including filling backpacks for weekend nourishment for students, adopting teachers and staff, and showering them with encouragement year-round, and even providing bicycles, bicycles at attendance for attendance and this incentives. Will you watch this video with me to hear leaders from First Dallas talk about their one plus one experience? As the new associate director of the Center for Missional Outreach, um, I just see that God is using one plus one in a way that allows us to enter into schools uh, for the power of discipleship and for the power of being in relationship in our communities. And so every opportunity to serve, every opportunity to uh, be in partnership with our communities um, lies in the public school. Children love quality attention and, and, and they love when you care. Like I have kids and everything we watch on TV is about caring and being a team and being friends. And so many children grow up in the world and they do not know caring, do not know sharing, do not know friends. Um, they know neglect, they know being underserved, they know what it is to be overlooked. And so when you see these children engaging these adults, so many questions as to whether or not you should have a partnership get answered in just watching them interact. Because so many things that we think are important or are needed for the child, it's, really not that deep at all, it's pretty simple. I just need someone here. You know, the, the message of the church is to be involved in the world. And what is more worldly than a public school? What is more important than a public school? Uh, there are great challenges to public schools and public education, not just in Dallas, not just in Texas, but in our country. So churches need to be in public schools because Public schools have huge challenges that volunteers from churches can help me. At the end of the day, I am really impatient and and am always trying to push our congregation to see themselves as I see them. Um, I see this congregation and many of our congregations in the North Texas Conference as a group of people who are called and compelled to share the good news and all they have to do is step outside of their church and do so. Church School Partnerships helps us to move in a new and dramatic way to be who God is calling us to be. Yes, for our church, but more so for the kids around us. Good morning. I'm Holly Bandell, the Associate Minister for Mission and Advocacy at First GI Methodist Church, Dallas. Our first hand experience at JJ Rhodes Learning Center in Dallas has made a huge impact on students, teachers, administrators, and also our church family. This experience has inspired our church to develop a bold initiative that now has the potential to bless communities and churches all around North Texas. The initiative is called One Plus One Dallas, and you might find a flyer like this in your welcome bag. One Plus One Dallas is a partnership with First United Methodist Church Dallas, Dallas ISD through the Office of Racial Equity, Pastors for Texas Children, the Meadows Foundation, and the Center for Missional Outreach. The mission of One Plus One Dallas is simple. It is to bridge communities of faith with schools, to make partnerships that really do make a difference. The vision of One, da one Plus One Dallas is a bold one. It's for every school in Dallas ISD to have a thriving faith community partnership in the next five years. Jason Lewis is our newly hired executive director, and you met him. He was introduced yesterday here at annual conference. His role is twofold. It's to connect communities of faith with DISD schools and to share the best practices for faith community school partnerships based on what we are learning in the field of Dallas 
with communities and churches all across the North Texas Conference. We want to invite you to be a part of this initiative. We are having a launch lunch on August 30th and hope you will um, RSVP to come. Dr. Michael Hinojosa with, from Dallas ISD, the superintendent, will be with us. We are grateful to Bishop McKee and the leaders of North Texas for the vision of one plus one, and we are passionate and excited to live this out in a new way through one plus one Dallas. We hope you will join us. Thank you so much, Holly. So this fall, Jason and I would love to come uh, to visit your church so that we can present and preach the theology of your missions through One Plus One, uh, so that we can have every school in your community have a thriving church school partnership. This could be bigger, though, than your church and school. This could be bigger than what your church can do alone. So imagine with me, what would it be like for every school in your community to have a thriving church school partnership? Our hope in the CMO is to multiply the vision of One Plus One Dallas. So come on, imagine with me again. Uh, imagine with me a One Plus One Prosper, a One Plus One Dallas, a One Plus One Wichita Falls, a One Plus One Sulphur Springs. Dream with me about the United Methodist Church being the engine that drives church school partnerships. For every public school in our communities, let's allow the spirit of Christ to open up new ways to improve our schools and to see and get to know new faces through new spaces in One Plus One. This fall, the CMO will be piloting three One Plus One cohorts, one urban, one rural, and one suburban. Limited space. Jason and I will be involved in these cohorts and they are designed to create intentional spaces for pastoral and missional leaders to begin or deepen or strengthen or expand your church school partnerships. We want to lean into this bold vision of one plus one. So if you are interested in learning more, contact me using the information on the slide or take out your phone right now. You can do that and you can text the keyword one plus one to 66866 and then it'll give me your information. One child plus one adult one church plus one school equals two change lives, one community at a time. What better way to connect with families in our communities who may have no connection to Jesus or to the church, you know, the nuns and the duns. What better way to listen well in hopes of building new relationships and possibly gathering new faces and new spaces in educational justice than through our schools. Every opportunity lies there in order for us to make a difference. I know there are a few pioneers ready to make that leap. As a conference, we are embracing a call to cultivate relationships with new people who have little or no connection with our churches. This pioneering work calls for leaders, both lay and clergy, who feel called by God to gather around them people who are uncomfortable or unfamiliar with our traditional churches. These innovative pioneers are compelled to create new, highly contextual expressions of Christian community. They tend to be people who are naturally connected with people outside of the church context. Pioneers tend to be natural entrepreneurs who like to start things, like meetup groups, neighborhood grill outs, lemonade stands, Bible studies, and mission initiatives. They imagine what could be and are willing to give it a go. Pioneers tend to be action oriented. They don't want to just talk about stuff forever. They want to get out there and try stuff. They have a low tolerance for the status quo and are itching to have an impact, to do something that moves the mission of God forward. Pioneers tend to be comfortable with risk. They don't have to have all the answers before they try something. They're fine with experimenting and they see failure as a necessary part of learning and moving forward. 
Pioneers tend to be idea people. They're busy dreaming up what doesn't yet exist. These creatives may drive some of us crazy because they always have something new up their sleeves. We believe many, if not most, of these pioneers will be laypersons who are identified, cultivated, and equipped in ways we are just beginning to discover. We will need a broad and healthy ecosystem for leadership development in the North Texas Conference. Let's take a look. An ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Keeping the whole system healthy requires the health of all the parts in balance. Whether it is a starfish, a wolf, a plant, or an elephant, an ecosystem may experience a dramatic shift if a species is missing. A healthy leadership development ecosystem for the North Texas Conference equips leaders for both traditional spaces in our inherited churches and pioneering spaces that can happen anywhere. Our ecosystem begins with our youngest. We reach young, current, and future leaders through our Wesleyan Formation initiatives. From these environments of Wesleyan Formation, we begin to identify leaders. We develop these leaders through youth academies, national conferences, internship opportunities, and leadership roles. As leaders emerge, they also nurture and develop future leaders. If something is missing in the ecosystem, then the whole environment suffers. When the ecosystem is healthy, it produces pioneers who are called by God, natural connectors and entrepreneurs, action-oriented, risk-taking, idea people, as well as encouragers and permission givers. Through all our work, we encounter people discerning their purpose. For some, this will be about how to embody Christian values in their professional and personal life. And for some, it means a call to professional ministry and possibly even ordination. For all of us, a healthy ecosystem means each of us using our gifts in our communities to give witness to the gospel and to participate in the transforming work God is already doing. When the system is healthy, we are able to cultivate young and culturally diverse leaders who can reach the mission field connecting with new faces in new spaces. I'm excited about the many opportunities for spiritual growth, community, and leadership that are nurturing our children and youth and their leaders in the North Texas Conference. A Time for Children is a program designed by Reverend Dr. Leanne Hadley and taken on by the children's ministry pioneers behind me and offered to all of those who lead children's ministries in our North Texas churches. We believe that children are inherently spiritual. However, children's curriculum is not always designed to engage with that depth. A Time for Children helps equip our children's ministry leaders to cultivate an environment where our children can develop their innate capacity to listen for God's presence. We believe God is speaking to and through our children, just like God is speaking to each and every one of us here. So far, we have had 30 churches in our Time for Children three-year cohort model of learning. Those who have completed this program are now training others, and we are seeing a life-giving community forming. The commitment and consistency among our children's ministry workers in A Time for Children has led to an environment of spiritual transformation in their classrooms, their programs, and their camps. Over the last three years, we have learned a great deal about this discipleship model and now have children that are rolling up into youth. We want to make sure that as children move into our youth programs, their leaders can continue to nurture the spiritual language and practices learned beyond fifth grade. This fall, we will be starting a time for youth, intentionally adapting the model for youth in an older context. Along with these offerings for youth and children's leaders, we're also excited about an intentional program for our youth to serve in leadership. This summer, we will be piloting a new youth leadership program that's designed to give young people real opportunities to serve and lead at Bridgeport Summer Camp. These youth will be trained to help lead small groups and reflect on their leadership experiences on a daily basis. We are also hoping, hoping to partner with churches that these young leaders attend and encourage their pastors and youth leaders to continue to give them opportunities to practice the skills that they're learning. In this way, we hope that this new youth leadership program will have an impact not just on our camps, but on our churches as well. These programs are forming our youngest disciples, some of whom will be the pioneers and planters of tomorrow.
Thanks to, thanks to your vote yesterday, our center has a new name. We are now the Center for Church Development, the CCD. In past years, we thought of church planting being relegated to a few of our larger churches. That is changing. Amen. In the CCD, in the Center for Church Development, we are committed to working with all types of churches and developing new ways of doing church. Now, new spaces is not what we traditionally think of as church plants. They're not necessarily designed to grow up into worshiping communities or even designed to funnel people into existing churches. New spaces is a new way of doing church, a new way of planting churches. Now, this does not mean we're abandoning the traditional way of planting church or planting traditional churches. Just this past January, the Center for Church Development hired a church planter and a consultant to be the associate director for church planting in our center. And I introduce to you Matt Temple. Thanks. Uh, everyone's still awake? We're all, we're all still here. Smack yourself around a little bit. Um, it's been a privilege to travel around the conference and meet several of you over the past few months, and I look forward to uh, moving forward, getting to know so many more of you. Uh, as we talk about ecosystems and developing leaders uh, and pioneers in our conference, uh, one of the things the, church, the Center for Church Development identified over the past several months was our own need to reevaluate and reimagine our process uh, for supporting church planters through each unique stage of a church plan. So to do this, we organized a team made up of planters from within the conference, uh, and our first task was to look at church plants through the lens of human development and try to discern what are the unique stages of development that a church plant goes through and then from there, we were able to ask the question, what specific and timely support can we give to planters in each stage of the development? Out of that question, our planting support system is beginning to emerge, and at the center of it is a 12-month cohort designed to uh, make space for creativity and innovation, a space where planters can walk through a process of discernment uh, while ultimately clarifying their vision for starting a new faith community. We're calling it the Genesis Cohort, and it starts July 1st, and we have approximately 20 people at various stages of the church plant process who are going to participate in the cohort with us. We wanted you to meet a few of them, so uh, this afternoon I've asked a few of our planters that are entering the launch stage of their plant to introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Ricky Harrison, and I have been serving this past year planning a new faith community called Pecan Street Mission, anchored out of First United Methodist Church in Decatur. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Ramirez, and I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to plan second campus of Casa Linda uh, in the southeast Dallas area near Mesquite which is in Spanish and is Casa Linda at Plaza Man Church. Thank you. My name is Chris Melvin. I am a, 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 the lead pastor now of the umbrella of First United Methodist Church McKinney of Harvest United Methodist Church in a community called Trinity Falls in Northwest McKinney. Hello, uh, my name is Josh Esparza. I'm going to be the campus pastor at Owenwood, uh, which is connected with White Rock United Methodist Church in East Dallas. And so at Owenwood, we will be partnering with um, people to help resource our neighbors, as well as creating um, opportunities for new faces uh, to engage spiritually in the liturgy, as well in the sacredness uh, of one another through the sharing of a meal during our worship services. Thank you. Hello, I'm Idalia Luna, and I'm so thankful to God that I will be planting a beautiful church, uh, Chapel Hill at Farmer's Branch. Blessings. Hello, my name is Taylor Smith. I have been commissioned to start a new church in Uptown Dallas. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to take a uh, love offering. <laughs> Thank you. 
If you have ever thought of planting or uh, want to think about it now, give me a call. I'll take you out to lunch and uh, we'll, we'll get you in the process. Uh, the CCD is supporting our planters as well as other pastors and leaders throughout the conference with cohorts, but also with coaches who come, who come alongside our leaders to help them develop and execute their vision. So I invite you to take a couple minutes and watch this video that captures some of the brilliant work being done by coaches in our conference. Well, I was invited to be part of the program um, and to have a coach. And so I joined the program, I think in the fall. And so every month my coach calls and we chat for an hour. And um, I set the agenda and unfortunately he takes notes. And so he refers back to and last time we talked about it. And so it's just been a wonderful experience for me. The experience, it, it was, you, we became like friends, you know. So as she got to know me, and but it wasn't like something that she would ask, you know, that are easy questions. Um, as time progressed, it got she was asking me difficult questions, tough questions. You know, for me was there was a point where I was kind of choosing between being a father and being a youth minister. And so she asked me, uh, one of the tough questions was, would you be able to do this, um, you know, balance both being a father and being in the ministry? And it, it was a difficult question, you know, because I was able to find ways to balance it. I think one of the biggest benefits to my ministry through this initiative has been really focusing in and honing, the, asking the right questions. Um, and those questions help me dive deeper into what's really going on in the church and in my particular context. They help me not just kind of skim through the surface. And when I get to something that maybe needs more attention or some sort of change, it helps me not see quick fixes, but really to ask those deep probing questions. And um, Edlin's guidance and coaching has helped me to hone those questions, but also has given me the courage and the confidence to find the resources I need to address them um, and to really continue to dig deep into them to make some lasting change. I coach because I want people to intentionally live into their full potential and God's calling on their life. As an advanced leadership coach, we use techniques that promote transformational leadership, such as being present, listening deeply, asking powerful questions, expanding possibilities, and action planning and accountability. Standing on stage with me are just some of our trained leadership coaches. As of today, the North Texas Conference has 20 coaches who have received 60 hours of International Coaching Federation approved executive leadership coach training. This past year, our 11 initial coaches were utilized by 45 clergy and lay staff across the conference. We know that 70% of leadership development comes from experience which can be leveraged another 25%, 20% by utilizing a coach or a mentor. Given our complex and fast-changing world, our leaders, especially our pioneers, need support. Coaching helps leaders become agile learners and adaptive leaders who are able to learn from their experiences and apply those lessons to future challenges. In coaching, the bulk of the instruction does not come from the coach. The coach is not a teacher or an expert, necessarily. Instead, a coach helps to mine the expertise and internal wisdom of the leader, of the coachee. Coaching helps provide accountability and forward action for goals defined by the person that is being coached. And then in group coaching, participants learn from their peers and apply the learning in their own context. This coach approach process helps leaders, both clergy and laity, discern the God-sized things that need to happen to develop a plan to get there, and then to celebrate when they do. 
In the coming year, our Advanced Leadership Coaching Initiative will deploy these 20 trained coaches to approximately 100 clergy and laity, staff and lay leadership across North Texas. Leadership cohorts will engage groups of clergy and laity through the Artful Academy for Artful Leadership. Coaching will be a key component for our pioneers and planters, as well as for our youth and our children's ministers going through a time for children and a time for youth. For more information on how to access our coaching resource and these programs, please check out our conference website. As you've heard, coaching is being utilized by all of our centers. Let's give the Center for Leadership Development a hand for leading this initiative. I myself am a certified coach and have participated in the coach trainings that have been led by the Center for Leadership Development. As coaches, we believe that each individual is creative, resourceful, and whole. At its heart, coaching is journeying with another person in a way that is highly relational, deeply intentional, and it is always, always contextual. Enjoy this BCI video. United Methodist churches are struggling across the nation, particularly black United Methodist churches. Many are closing and not many are opening. So we had the purpose for the North Texas Conference Black Church Initiative is to help the churches, pastors and laity working together to know what it means to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and to have as their focus the Great Commission. The Black Church Initiative of the North Texas Conference has already shaped my ministry, uh, just working with the, the great leadership that is over it uh, and helping me as a young pastor to strengthen my leadership skills, uh, to strengthen my stewardship skills uh, and impacting the village where I currently serve as lead pastor and helping us to really see a model for getting out into the community uh, where lives are needing to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, you know what's so exciting is, it actually has given us an opportunity to bring to the fore new leaders, individuals that we've, we've been looking at, studying. And so the leadership team uh, within the Black uh, Church Initiative at St. Paul, uh, individuals who have not held leadership positions, but people, a uh, diverse group of folk, uh, you know, millennials, uh, Gen Xers, and baby boomers representing, represented in that, uh, that leadership team. And so that's what really is exciting. Locally, BCI has the potential to turn the North Texas Conference upside down with positive, productive churches. The plan, as I understand it, is to strengthen Hamilton Park, St. Paul and St. Luke first. And then we are to turn around and strengthen others. It makes a lot of sense to me, and I know we can do it. Well, BCI, I would just pray that it would continue to not only help St. Luke, but help the black church to be a vital place where people can experience help, hope, and healing. I believe BCI would be critical in helping the black church move forward to the preferred future. And I'm excited about BCI. Somebody needs to say amen. amen. We, the design team of Black Church Initiative of the North Texas Conference, and the pastors and laity of those churches are thankful to Bishop McKee's vision to strengthen our black churches for the North Texas Conference, and we now have hope. We are partnering with the national organization 2020 Leadership to strengthen our pastoral leadership teams, and they will work hand in hand with our, their laity to develop their own intentional discipleship making program that will in turn grow our churches. Secondly, our Center for Church Development has partnered with Dr. Alice McKenzie of the Perkins School of Theology and the Center for Preaching Excellence. We have selected a cohort of pastors and those pastors are with me, uh, the cohort pastors will stand forward. Come forward so they'll see who you are. They saw you on the video, but just call them out. We will be working with Reverend Dr. Kevin Muriel, who is a lead pastor of the Cascade United Methodist Church in Atlanta, the leader of one of the largest black United Methodist churches in our nation. 
and myself as a shepherd for this group will focus on preaching excellence in our black churches. It's a way of saying iron sharpens iron. If you know anything about the black churches, preaching excellence must be in place for the churches to grow. Somebody needs to say amen. amen. And thirdly, we are also formed a cohort of our young African-American pastors to strengthen their gifts and skills in leadership, church growth, and preaching. This group, for most of this year, has been made up of all men. Last month, we identified a young woman from the village named Melissa, who has had the opportunity to practice and perfect her preaching uh, craft because her pastor, Reverend Derek Jacobs, has given her the opportunity to preach many times. We're thankful for that. I'm excited about Melissa, and I love hearing her preach, so thank you. All of this work is being done with our pastors in cohorts using coaches that are content rich in what it means to, to be the black church. If we didn't have co coaches that are content rich in what it means to, black, to be the black church, we would just have theory. And theory for the sake of theory is time out for those days. It's time for us to be about our father's business, amen? I want to thank the members of the design team standing with me here today. I can't see them all, but if each one of you can just come up and say your name as the church planters did. I'm Dr. Mike Bowie, senior pastor of St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. I'm Dr. Weena Lee, pastor of the United Methodist Church of the Disciple in DeSoto, Texas. And she is the chair of our design team. My name is Edlin Cowley, I'm a senior minister at Fellowship United Methodist Church and Trophy Club. I'm Reverend Preston Wheeler, executive pastor of St. Paul United Methodist Church, Dallas. I am Phoebe Hutchins, St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. Hi, I'm Lisa Cooper, Camp Wisdom United Methodist. Hello, I'm Mae Francis Rowlett, St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. James Weiner, uh, Senior Pastor at Glen Oaks and uh, Camp Wisdom Churches. Christopher O'Reilly, the Associate Pastor at Hamilton Park United Methodist Church. We are looking forward to what God will do in the black churches of the North Texas Conference. And we believe as our black churches are strengthened, the entire North Texas Conference will be strengthened for God's glory. Somebody needs to say amen. Amen. So if you, as you may have noticed, all of our centers are using coaching. All of our centers are using cohorts. This is intentional because ministry is hard. Ministry can be lonely. And you are hearing us ask you to move into new spaces, to experiment, to risk, and to even allow space for failure. Ministry can be hard. And so we are designing cohorts that are going to be communities of practice similar to the original Methodist bands and classes. Communities that can help us mine the wisdom, experience, and support of our colleagues. Foundational to our cohorts is the idea that each one of us brings gifts that are resourceful for the whole. Stated plainly, we are better together. Since starting as the director of the CCD last July, I have been in over 115 of our North Texas Conference churches. And what I have discovered is that gathering new faces in new spaces is not just a new program we need. It is a new strategy. It is a new way of being the church. Using the terminology of Isaiah, it is the new thing that we perceive God doing. 
and it is springing forth. The district superintendents, the center directors, we're aligning our work around gathering new faces and new spaces through our local churches and United Methodist entities. And we are prepared to put our resources behind this for the long haul. So here are the next steps. This summer, we will host three conference calls. And anyone, anyone in this room, anyone in your church is welcome to jump in. In the first half of this call, you'll have the opportunity to share your initial ideas about how to gather new faces in new spaces. Everyone will be able to listen in and be inspired and to gather up new ideas. In the second half of the call, we'll focus on one or two of those ideas and offer real-time coaching to help you move forward. Then in the fall, we plan to offer three vision days. The goal for these vision days is to give clergy and laity everything you need to begin dreaming and scheming about the new spaces God is calling you to create. At these vision days, we will cast the vision once more of new spaces. We'll tell stories about how laity and clergy are creating new spaces across North Texas and around the country. And then we will describe in detail what the centers will bring to the table to support you in this work. And support is the key word. First, we plan to gather the pioneers, the innovators, and learning cohorts where you will receive ongoing coaches, the latest learnings about new spaces. You will receive support and encouragement from peers. The other form of support is we are prepared to put money behind it. The, amen. <laughs> the district superintendents, the center directors, we have already set aside $200,000 to get us started over the next two years to support new spaces in uh, gathering new faces in new spaces. These will be micro grants that will range in size from $500 to several thousand dollars with the idea of catalyzing your ideas, catalyzing your work. But we want to be clear. Do not think that you need conference staff or conference support to start a new space. We do not want to be a bureaucracy that hinders your work. We want you to be set free to do ministry. The last thing we want to do is get in your way. So if you have a vision, if the Lord is stirring in your heart, or you know those in your church who God is moving in their lives, they are those pioneers of which Marty spoke. Do not wait on us. Get started. Go, be the church. But if you see value in how we can support you through coaching, through being part of a cohort, or through a micro grant, we ask you to submit a new spaces application. And you'll find the link right up there on the screen. One last next step is finally in early 2019, we will lead our first Pioneers Retreat. This weekend retreat will gather together, again, clergy and lay pioneers to prepare them to launch their new spaces. Now, we know that gathering new faces and new spaces may sound like something new, maybe daunting. Maybe some of you have felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit and you are experiencing discernment by nausea at this very moment. <laughs> but we believe that God is calling the North Texas Conference to do this kind of pioneering work. And we believe that because God has called us, God will equip us for this work. We believe that there are pioneers with gifts for creating new spaces in every local church, just waiting to be inspired and unleashed. We believe that those who like their church as it is, can still wholeheartedly support those pioneers and innovators by giving them cover and by supporting the new thing that they are doing. We believe that as we experiment with new spaces, inevitably, we will fail here and there. But we can choose to not be afraid of failure and instead to learn from it. We believe that people in our mission field are trying to find meaning and create community. We believe that the church is still relevant and needed in today's world. 
We believe that God will equip us to gather new faces in new spaces. We believe that God is moving and it is springing forth from Wichita Falls to Trinity Falls. From Mount Vernon to Mount Calvary. From Sherman to Kaufman. From Roy City to Archer City to the city of Dallas. From St. Paul to St. Andrew to St. Joe. From churches called Wesley to Wesley Korean to our Wesley Foundations. From Clarksville to Louisville to Gainesville. From Christ Church Fairview, from Christ Plano and Farmers Branch to Christ's Foundry. From Glen Oaks to Oak Lawn to Oak Haven and North Haven. Every church. Every church. Every, every church. church. Every church gathering new faces in new spaces. To form disciples in the way of Christ. Join us on a conference call this summer. Come to a vision day in your district. Share your ideas with us. And let's gather new faces and new spaces and introduce them to the God who already knows them and loves them. Amen. Amen. Amen.